welcome from the Diplomatic Academy in Vienna to our online conference on digitalizing international affairs. Um, I'm the director of the Diplomatic Academy uh, and uh, we are here with uh, the program organizer, Professor Markus Kornbrobst, who is at the Academy Professor for uh, International Relations uh, and for, for um, also International Affairs. Uh, and I'm happy to welcome uh, also a lot of our speakers for this online conference. So welcome from Vienna. I'm saying this from Vienna, but my background is from, it shows the river Avon uh, in Stratford. And I've chosen this because I think digitalization can also sometimes help to bring us closer to nice parts of the world. Uh, and also because of the fact that uh, Shakespeare, to my mind, plays a role in the future of digitalization. But this is something maybe for a different conference. Uh, the conference has a very broad uh, topic, actually, because we are uh, all aware how much digitalization, uh, the future of the digital world, will impact international affairs directly and, in, and indirectly. Uh, and I guess we will discuss this uh, in details. Let me just say at the beginning, um, I'm not so sure whether uh, digital world is something different from the invention of the telephone 100 years ago. Uh, is it only a tool, a new tool or new tools, a toolkit that we have uh, on hand? Or is there really a game changing situation also for international affairs? Uh, and I know that this will be discussed because uh, obviously new actors are approaching in the digital world also in international affairs, uh, the examples are manifold uh, regarding online giants, companies which, uh, which we have to deal with in regulatory, uh, regulatory reports in, on international affairs and certainly also in the, in the legal field. Uh, but uh, maybe the most important change as, as I see is, and that we have to be aware also as diplomats, is that power relations uh, may fundamentally change. Uh, and this is something we will follow up in the following years, certainly with a lot of, of, of interest. Uh, what is for sure that we need digital competences. What is for sure that we need to understand key technologies such as artificial intelligence, uh, cloud computing, quantum computing, and every day brings a new term which we have to deal with. Uh, as I see it at the moment, and that's what I hear also from conferences I'm taking part, the issue of artificial intelligence and speech recognition uh, has the, the highest priority. Uh, and we, we should discuss whether this is also true for international uh, affairs. There may be the fact, and some people are, are, are doing research or should do research at least, that artificial intelligence can help us in issues of conflict resolutions, in finding compromises, uh, in um, creating even trust in conflict situations. Uh, but this is certainly something we need a research to really deal with it because there are other parts of artificial intelligence like, uh, like uh, uh, independent weapon systems, robots, uh, on the on the uh, in in wars where the positive fields of artificial intelligence are hard to find, so there's a lot on the plate. I'm very thankful to to Professor Kornbrobst that he uh, convenes this, this conference, uh, and I wish you a fruitful discussion. And I can promise that the academy will continue to work in this field, uh, and, and and I hope soon even by having a a master program on digital international relations. But this is something for the future. So over to you, Marcus, for the conference. Amy, thank you very much. Uh, let me welcome you as well. I mean, uh, every all the participants uh, to, this, to this workshop, I'm very, very happy that you agreed to be with us today. Um, also, hello to our audience, uh, be it on Zoom or be it on Facebook. And I promise that we're going to do this in as interactive a fashion as, as possible, despite the, the Zoom environment. Uh, but it is probably quite fitting to have a conference on digital international affairs, well, digitally. Um, 
there are uh, a few things uh, that one could say a lot of things, obviously, why this conference on digital international affairs. Um, it's the follow up actually of a workshop that has taken place in mid October here, uh, which is uh, very much disciplinaries so about the discipline of international relations and uh, so so bringing uh, scholars of international relations political science from all over the world actually together to talk about digital international relations what it actually means and um, this is now a follow-up that is actually very important for us because uh, it is very much interdisciplinary uh, so most importantly, crosses the divide between the social science and the natural sciences. And equally important, it is non-disciplinary as well, because not all of our uh, um, contributors um, are disciplinary in the sense of, of, of being scholars of a very peculiar uh, discipline and perhaps dealing with a very peculiar uh, niche within that discipline. Uh, but there are also quite a few practitioners, so we're going to bridge the divide between theory and practice as well. Um, why should we care about digital international affairs? Um, perhaps as a, as a way of a, a, a personal introduction, why I'm interested in that. Uh, there is obviously this phenomenon that technology was always very important for politics and international politics. So if one thinks about, say, the invention of the printing press long, long time ago, then uh, that triggered certain political dynamics. Yeah? So suddenly there could be a mass production of books. Uh, because of that, uh, you could disseminate messages much better in written form. Uh, because of that, uh, vernacular languages actually uh, developed, uh, which was then a prerequisite for nations for nationalism for being able to imagine a nation and so on and so forth if you think about the industrial revolution and you think about the invention of uh, radio television everything those are obviously all landmarks um, in terms of how politics and international politics developed um, and there's this uh, so reading about these things and there for for figures i have to I have to uh, read something to you very quickly that i found um, it's a uh, research by Klinkenborg, and um, he suggests that uh, all words ever spoken by human beings since the dawn of times could be stored in 0 0.005 zettabytes. And uh, if we compare that, then uh, we were at 33 zettabytes in 2018, and estimates predict that we may be at 175 zettabytes in 2025. So that tells us something about the datafication, which is probably an important aspect of the ongoing digital revolution. And one could obviously go on and say, even that digital revolution, if it at some stage comes to an end, then it's uh, not less technology, but it will be yet another leap forward in terms of quantum computing, for instance. Um, so uh, let me quickly uh, introduce the presenters and uh, in the interest, I want to keep it short for us uh, to have enough time for, for discussion. Um, I'm very happy that uh, for the first panel, Brigitte Krenn is going to be the chair, she's going to do the discussion moderation. I'm very happy for it because uh, I myself am not that tech savvy. And I think for that panel in title Technological Parameters of Digitalizing International Relations, uh, an excellent expertise in technical affairs is actually a, a real advantage. Then uh, we're going to go on with the talk by Paul Smith. Um, he's from the Austrian Institute of Technology. And then we're going to um, continue with Heather Pace Clark from Analytics and then with Anna Grichting from Qatar University. Then uh, we're going to have a break, about 15 minutes. And um, then we're going to go on with our second panel. I think not everyone is here now, that's, and that's not a problem. There will be at the time. There's also a time difference. <clears throat> now we're going to have um, a presentation by Clara Blume and Martin Rauchbauer from Open Austria. Then uh, by Veronika Wittmann from the University of Linz. 
by Stefan Wuschitz from Ms. Balthasar Lab and by our very own doctoral student, Stephanie Ness. Um, thank you for the invitation. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, yeah, I just hand the floor over to the first presenter, um, to Paul Smith. Uh, please go ahead. Okay, so uh, I shall share my screen. I have prepared some slides. I hope you can see them now. Yes? yes. Perfect. So <clears throat> thank you very much. And thank you very much for the opportunity to, to, to speak today. It's, uh, personally, it's very interesting to be invited to a sort of uh, multidisciplinary event like this. So uh, I'm a computer scientist by trade, uh, so perhaps a more technical, uh, yeah, coming from a more technical background. Uh, so I work for an, uh, an organization called the Austrian Institute of Technology, where I'm a, a senior scientist. And we do research on uh, the security and resilience of uh, cyber physical systems uh, with some focus on, on, on critical infrastructures. And I guess as a computer scientist, I can't say anything without PowerPoint. So I <laughs> prepared, prepared some slides to, to, to bore you all to death with. So I, I'll, uh, I'll launch straight into it. Um, so <clears throat> basically the, the background is I'm gonna sort of try and talk to, I guess this, uh, this notion of digitalization as a, as a very broad sort of uh, understanding, but I, I'm gonna focus on what it means for, for critical infrastructures and and the implications of digitalization uh, for security, um, and cybersecurity in particular. So, so if we think generally about critical infrastructures, why, why the move to digital, right? What's the benefit uh, that organizations face, for example, over kind of using sort of purely analog technologies, okay? So there's the opportunity, for example, to do real-time sharing of data, uh, which can be used to do sort of uh, improved analytics or uh, improve the efficiency of infrastructures, monitor the infrastructure. Of course, failure, failure diagnostics is super important in this area. If you think about safety issues, so there's many of these critical infrastructures uh, have sort of, there are significant safety constraints that need to be considered. In the past, there's been a sort of tendency to use sort of proprietary solutions to implement these critical infrastructures. Uh, from particular vendors. And so the move to digitalization sort of opens that up a little bit with the use of uh, sort of open standards, open technologies that can be applied in this area. Of course, we get the opportunity to do things like remote access that we're doing now, which until recently wasn't really thought of in this domain. And of course, we had the opportunity for lots of new functionality to be introduced uh, to these systems. So to enable all of that functionality, I guess there are sort of three uh, sort of, well, three technology trends that are perhaps interesting to mention. I'm sure there are more. Uh, there's the sort of this concept of integrating information technology, sort of types of enterprise systems and environments that we all sort of work with, you know, our windows machines, um, uh, doing sort of personnel management and I don't know, uh, looking at the financial aspects of an enterprise, uh, to couple those types of systems more closely with what we call operational technology. So basically the, the devices and the systems that control the, the physical process, uh, that's part of the, the critical infrastructure. Um, so I don't know, for example, uh, in an energy system to couple maybe the more enterprise environments with those that are used to control the infrastructure, to open circuit breakers and all this kind of stuff. And so the idea is here you could you could operate the, uh, the infrastructure more efficiently and uh, perhaps do sort of things like predictive maintenance. I guess like everybody else, uh, we're looking to sort of leverage machine learning or AI, uh, for example, to detect unusual states or classify behavior of the infrastructure to perhaps detect unusual events. And I guess in general, improve efficiency. And then there's this sort of new technology that's sort of emerging, and, and I'm sure many of you have heard this, this term before, this concept of a, of a digital twin. So the idea here is that you have a virtual representation of a physical infrastructure. 
So I don't know, a wind turbine or, or, a, or a, a pressurizer in a reactor or something like this um, that you can use to do things like predictive maintenance with. So you collect data from the real infrastructure, feed it to a, a model and then do some computation over that and get some idea, for example, when components might need changing and there's potential benefits also for security. So there's lots of good reasons to to move to, to digital technology in this area. And it's, it's happening whether, I guess, many of us, whether we like it or not. Um, but of course, introducing all these de digital technology uh, introduces new cybersecurity risks, which uh, is, I guess, what I'm interested in. Um, <clears throat> so, and there's a particular type of cybersecurity risk that, uh, that we're interested in. It's basically uh, cyber attacks that result in some sort of consequence in the in the physical world. Okay, so some cyber-born adversary uh, somehow manages to transition into being able to manipulate systems uh, in, in in the in the physical space. So there there are a handful, if you like, thankfully, of uh, sort of recentish examples of this kind of attack. So. The, 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 the most notable, I guess, example, the one that sort of triggered a lot of interest in this topic, and thankfully, well, maybe not thankfully, but research funding anyway, was the, uh, the so-called Stuxnet virus, where uh, a sort of cyber attack was able to cause damage to a nuclear enrichment facility in Iran. Uh, so that sort of triggered people thinking, oh, okay, so here we have some sort of cyber weapon capability where somebody could stealthily attack an infrastructure and cause some sort of physical consequence in the real world. Then I think more recently than that, in sort of 2015, 2016, there was a, a fairly disruptive attack that took place in Ukraine where um, basically there was a significant power blackout. Uh, I think it was several hundred thousand sort of um, uh, households were, were disconnected from the, from the grid. Uh, causing, causing a blackout. And again, this is a sort of a, an example of a, a very targeted attack using relatively advanced sort of techniques to, to cause some sort of um, disruption. And then uh, more recently, there was a, an attack uh, that happened, I think, in the, in, in the Middle East, where the adversaries were targeting, interestingly, for the first time, or apparently the first time, safety-related systems. So these are, these are the systems that uh, ultimately, if everything fails, should enable the, the system to move into some sort of safe state, okay, so that people don't get hurt or there's not some uh, effect in the, in, in the environment. So this was a sort of interesting and potentially worrying new sort of type of threat. But I guess in general, the, the, these in, incidents are fairly infrequent at the moment, so all our lights are still on, right, uh, for the most part. Uh, for the, <laughs> they're mostly attributed to sort of nation state actors, so very sophisticated and well resourced uh, groups that target these infrastructures. In general, the attribution of these, uh, these threats to those nation state actors takes time. Uh, so it's not like an immediate thing, which is possibly interesting for for diplomacy so there's a there's a you know maybe several weeks months after the incident before you can point the finger with some probability at some threat actor that that caused these things and it's not not not, not an easy thing to do and in general uh these these attacks are quite difficult to realize they're sort of technically challenging to 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 you know pull off so basically the, the infrastructures are very specialized and it's not just anybody on the street that can do this but one question that interests me is uh, could this change in the future and what what are the implications for for, for critical infrastructures so in in sort of our line of work what we tend to do is uh, take a look at the different types of threat actors that uh, could uh, affect our system. So this is, is a way of kind of under, trying to understand the risk that any, our or our infrastructure might face. So here are sort of four, if you like, high level types of threat actors or uh, attackers. Yeah? So we have 
uh, insiders, so people who work within infrastructure who have deep knowledge of how it works. Um, we have state-sponsored actors, or the, the, the sort of groups that are, for example, yeah, well, sponsored by states, so very capable. So-called hacktivists, so these are um, uh, sort of disparate groups to some extent with some sort of political motive uh, to, to cause some sort of disruption. And then, of course, uh, cyber criminals, so the people that are in this game to, to make a lot of money. Okay, so, <clears throat> so if you look at these sort of different actors uh, and their motivation, so if you think about an insider, so this is a sort of typical type of analysis you would do for these threat actors. So if you look at, for example, insiders, so the, the motivation to pull off this kind of attack is quite low, but their capability is relatively sophisticated, right? So they, they have the deep knowledge so that there's a potential that they could do this, but they're not, not really sort of likely to, to move on this. So state-sponsored actors, are, of course, their motivation is high, at least to have some sort of capability to do this, okay? Uh, so, and their capability is sophisticated. And as I mentioned, the previous incidents that we saw um, were largely carried out by nation state actors. So the hacktivists, uh, the sort of motivation is quite unpredictable. So you never quite know whether you're gonna be on the receiving end of, of the, if you like the wrath of some of these groups, uh, but their capability tends to be quite limited in a sense. So they usually do things like website defacement and, and other stuff. So they're not really in the game of, of targeting uh, 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 critical infrastructures. So the, the interesting one then maybe is, is cyber criminals. So their motivation is at the moment to target critical infrastructures is relatively low, but they can have a fairly high capability, right? And access to resources to, to fulfill these attacks. So one of the uh, situations, one of the questions that I'm asking myself all the time is, could this change in the future and why? Because I think if there's going to be a sort of step change in the way that critical infrastructures are targeted uh, for cybersecurity, I think it, it's possibly going to come from this group. So um, <clears throat> these, are, <laughs> these are sort of some trends that are general, generally speaking there. Uh, in relation to the infrastructure and, and sort of trends that relate to the to the threat, and I guess the the question is is whether in combination these things might result in a sort of change in the way that uh, critical infrastructures are targeted potentially or digitalized critical infrastructures are targeted. So starting on the the, the bottom left hand corner, there's a picture there of two electric vehicle electric vehicles charging. And what I'm trying to get at there is that increasingly the systems that we're using to support our critical infrastructures use sort of commercial off the shelf technologies, right? Uh, which from a cyber adversary's point of view is, is, is great because you can sort of use existing knowledge to exploit those. And they sort of use more open and sort of internet like protocols to, to control the systems. So for example, in the, the electric vehicle charging infrastructure here, the management of that infrastructure, if you look at the standards at the moment, is, is using internet-like pro protocols, the same types of protocols that we use, for example, for, for web technologies. Whereas in the past, these were sort of closed, proprietary, and difficult to understand. So, the, the, so that's one sort of thing that basically potentially lowers the barrier of entry, if you like, for cyber criminals to this space. The second picture there is a picture of the sort of actors in the so-called so smart grids. So, so the smart grid is basically a digitalized version of our power system with many, many more actors or so aggregators, energy service providers, prosumers, uh, as well as all the, the classic ones that we have that manage the medium and high voltage grid and those that provide power to us and all this kind of stuff. And in general, the idea is that we have more actors in this space and more open interfaces. So these actors need to communicate with each other. Okay, so there's a larger, what we call a tax surface available to an adversary. So they, there's more ways they can get into the system to exploit it. So this again sort of lowers the, the barrier to, to entry into digital infrastructures, I guess. Then <clears throat> the middle picture there sort of tries to highlight that in general, there's a, a bit of a trend that 
uh, cyber criminals are starting to look at uh, critical infrastructures as a potential target. So <clears throat> there's been this sort of trend, and maybe you've heard of it um, in the recent years called uh, of this particular type of uh, uh, behavior called uh, ransomware, where essentially an adversary will uh, encrypt your files on your, on your computer and then demand a ransom for them to decrypt it, okay? So if you don't pay them, basically you, you sort of lose all your data. And this was a sort of very, typically a fairly unfocused uh, type of adversarial behavior. So they would sort of, lots and lots of targets would be uh, hit in a sort of fairly uh, unstructured kind of way. But there's a, there's a sort of emerging trend basically driven by money, which is what cyber criminals are interested in, to become more targeted and, and uh, realize so-called multi-stage ransomware attacks, where they focus on high value targets, uh, and, in, and in particular on, on critical infrastructures. So that's, that's a sort of an interesting trend where the adversaries are kind of moving to becoming more specialized, cyber criminals becoming more specialized and more targeted in particular. Um, critical infrastructures. Okay, so uh, then the last two I'll go through quickly. <clears throat> Basically, we're getting more malware, so uh, adversarial uh, so attack behavior that's targeted for industrial control systems, and there's an increased use of common tool sets, which makes attribution quite hard. And then just as we're all looking at uh, AI and machine learning to make life better, so, so are sort of attackers um, they're adding that capability to their tool chain. So if you add all this to the mix, basically I think what you get is the potential for uh, more attacks on critical infrastructures and attribution getting a lot harder. So it's not all doom and gloom. And I feel bad starting this session actually, uh, because I think there's a lot of potential here and I'm starting off by saying everything's really, really bad, but it's not really, really bad. It's, it's uh, we're on top of it as a community, I guess. So there's lots of standardization and development of best practices that can help. Uh, regulation plays a, a sort of critical role. So in Europe, we've had this network and information security directive, which is sort of uh, aimed to, if you like, raise the minimum level of security across member states. Um, then there's lots of sort of national, international bodies that provide support, so-called ISACs, where organ uh, organizations get together to discuss problems, certs that provide direct support and an ESA and national cybersecurity centers. So to conclude, uh, yes, digitalization brings about huge benefits and I'm sure we're gonna hear a lot about those benefits, such as improving efficiencies and enabling new paradigms, such as a smart grid. And I think we'll hear about industry 4.0. Uh, this is great, but we need to think about cybersecurity because we introduce a new attack surface uh, which result, could result in societally significant consequences. Uh, uh, there's been some notable examples of this recently where there's sort of targeted attacks resulting in some physical consequence. Uh, this sort of, there's a potential for this to become more frequent, uh, causing more disruption. And in attribution, I guess, is a challenge in, in this area that, that could be sort of difficult in terms of international relations. Um, yeah, but there's a lot of help out there. So that's it for now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind of awakening talk. Yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is very good, yeah. And I'm uh, sure there will be a lot of questions. Uh, the, the plan is that the three speakers uh, first give their presentations and their opinions, and then we go into a general uh, Q&A and discussion section. So thank you very much. And uh, can we please go on to uh, Heather Paid clark uh, to your presentation? All right, so I thought I would mix it up a little bit and start out with a video, but let's see if that works. So you can just bear with me a moment.
Okay, so I think that's just a nice teaser uh, to show really what the potential is when it comes to actually leveraging um, satellite imagery. So I actually have a startup company that's dealing with that topic now, um, but I started out uh, working on digital divide issues and more of the diplomatic side of this topic when I was at the World Economic Forum. So I'm really excited to get to join some experts in the diplomacy area to talk about what is really critical. So geospatial data is of course all the satellite imagery that you benefit from without realizing it when you use Google Maps on your phone. And it can actually be combined with all kinds of other data. So socioeconomic data as well. It can be layered with environmental data, with all kinds of behavioral information to give you new insights uh, about citizens and also about infrastructure as we've already heard. So it's very agile. So when we talk about industry 4.0, another interesting topic is of course, what is gonna to happen to a lot of jobs where we can now do, for example, inspection of power lines and inspection of all kinds of infrastructure using drone technology. This is really exciting because it means you can cover much more uh, area and have a lot of data easily collected. But what does it mean for the people who lose their jobs who used to go out in the field and inspect these sites, for example, and also how do you use that data? So we work with a lot of clients, for example, who are using drones, but haven't really thought through how do we actually use this data? And then of course the governance isn't always in place for how to actually use the data, but it's creating a lot of interesting opportunities. Uh, one interesting example is, of course, the impact of human rights. We actually had a human rights watch come and speak about the work that they're doing in Geneva, since we're based in Zurich, about what they're doing to use satellite imagery to really monitor human rights violations around the world. So this is an example of things that they identified in Burma. But as you can imagine, this creates a lot of challenges when it comes to international affairs and, and privacy that we need to work out as an international community, I guess. There are also some exciting things going on when we look at artificial intelligence. Uh, so for example, in a lot of African countries, we have the outsourcing of actually AI image recognition. So when you do this data collection, someone has to go through all of that information and turn it into something meaningful. So there are a lot of exciting startups that are working all over Africa, for example, training people to do this image processing, which is creating a lot of interesting opportunities for development. Um, this is a, even a little bit earlier in the whole uh, digitization process. We had a lot of people being uh, transformed really through the microfinance and mobile fund banking movement that went on uh, earlier. So I think that the whole digitization is creating a lot of opportunities in emerging markets, but there definitely are some risks and concerns that we need to think about when it comes to how private data is handled if you are using your mobile phone and maybe protesting against the government and then that information is shared, what is the responsibility of the company that holds that data and how is the data being managed? So it's creating a lot of interesting but tough challenges. So now to focus a little bit more on energy, why is energy uh, and AI, how does it all come together? We already heard about smart um, grids. That's definitely a hot topic. It's really also just about helping the 1 million people that don't have power to get power faster they making it easier to build grids faster. That's what my company, Delytics, does. But it's also a lot about just making sure people have power. So this is a case here in Switzerland a few years ago when the grid uh, just shut down because there was a lack of information sharing between the Italian and the Swiss utilities. So now that there's more and more data available, we're trying to really make these cases less and make the information flow better. But we really need the work of government to make, to make that work. So now I'll just talk a little bit more about what, um, what my company does. When we talk about building infrastructure all over the world, there are a lot of people who are against it. There are a lot of people who don't want power lines in their backyard or they don't want um, a lot of environmentally protected areas to be harmed by new infrastructure coming in. And we've seen this amount of social um, resistance actually increasing. So we're trying to make it easier to communicate in a more transparent way with communities uh, about what the plans are for integrating new infrastructure. And this will also help to bring online a lot of new renewable energy, for example, which of course we all are trying to support as we look at the more aggressive um, and important climate targets that we have. So this is a little bit of a detail, which we've already touched on a little bit about all the different kinds of data that is currently available when we look at the energy system. I won't go into a lot of detail because uh, we had some really good introduction from the other speaker, but there's a lot of data that's available now and a lot of people in the, in the grid are thinking about, okay, how do we better meet customer needs with this data? How do we understand their buying power? 
How do we also come up with new business models to be more competitive if we are a, a grid operator? So there's all kinds of exciting opportunities, but of course there is the cybersecurity risk. This is actually from Hitachi. They uh, provide a wide range of, of energy infrastructure and are looking to digitize. So what do we actually do? So we are a startup that's based in Zurich and we basically help clients like the Swiss National Railway automate infrastructure routing. So this is doing exactly what Simon mentioned, doing the process more efficiently um, and faster. And really it's about taking data that hasn't been used before and putting it through our algorithm and giving it more meaning to help uh, companies plan, for example, the connection to a solar farm faster or the repair of an old line to do that much more efficiently as they move from, for example, nuclear to a hydro plant. And there are lots of these short and longer connections that need to be done all over the world. So our mission is really to accelerate the energy transition through, through this technology. So I think this is true for all kinds of industry 4.0 applications. We are looking at lots of money being wasted. People actually doing these processes with paper where they can do it in a less manual way and where they don't actually have accurate data. So we're trying to make that process much more data driven. So here's actually a demo of how it would work. This is actually the way GIS can be used. You can customize all the data that you have that's linked to human, landscape, nature, or other technical areas. And you can see here the start and the end point. This is for a power line that's going to be built in Colombia where they have lots of rainforest they need to be covered. And you can see the, the red shows a kind of risk map where there might be potential problems that need to be addressed. And the tool helps them to identify those problems and to really build the infrastructure much more quickly. In this case, it's quite exciting because they are actually uh, places where there's no, uh, no electricity. So here you can also then see, for example, in 2D and 3D where the power line would go. And if you move it, what would be the impact? And you can also see it in augmented reality. So it's quite exciting. You could go out into the field with your mobile phone and you could see exactly where the power line would go before it's being built. So this is really uh, useful for citizens to better understand the infrastructure, but also for um, NGOs to better express their concerns. So it's quite a useful technology that is going to be used more and more. Um, so here you can see a picture of the algorithm and actually what it generates again. I think I've kind of covered this, but it just is to give you an idea. This enhanced visualization is really, really powerful. And the visualization combined with the automation can really, really help to do infrastructure projects much faster. I wanted to make a point here. I think many of you are coming from government that this innovation really needs the support of government. So my company actually started in the ETH in Zurich. Uh, the algorithm was developed over many years of research. And then we got support from the European Space Agency and then the Horizon 2020 program, which is part of the EU. And that was really critical for allowing us to then work with industry to get the funding we needed to really uh, develop a tool that's quite useful. So I think for all of this new exciting innovation, when it comes to leveraging data and digitization, it's really about developing strong public private partnerships that I guess a lot of you working in government can really enable. And that's where a lot of the exciting innovation is, is really happening and is so critical. So we've all heard about the European Green Deal. It's really a great time to bring together infrastructure, the energy transition and big data because we all need new infrastructure. It needs to be more sustainable um, and using these kinds of solutions can really improve performance by around 50%. One of the key risks is getting people to use it. Obviously people are very concerned that this might take away their jobs. So we work with people like SwissGrid and the opinion once they get used to the tool is that these kinds of solutions make their, their process is more efficient and everything more transparent, but it's about making everyone comfortable with that transparency, which is a journey. So what are some key questions that are important to think about for the future? Of course, uh, AI needs to be regulated. There are a lot of exciting discussions going on at the UN here with the ITU, but also in many other organizations looking at how do you really regulate AI? How do we really retrain all these people who may lose their jobs due to the introduction to these new technologies? How do we tax this kind of digital trade? It is a question when we are sending data back and forth with our clients all over Europe or South America, how do, we, how do we manage that? And there isn't always a good governance framework in place. And then of course, key is how can governments support this innovation and help more young companies develop new ideas to help industry adopt uh, these innovative technologies. So thanks for your time and sorry for the technical glitch.
now we go on uh, to the last uh, talk of this session to Anna Critching. Okay, well, thank you very much um, for the invitation. Um, it's a real pleasure to uh, be with this um, distinguished panel and to speak today. Um, I just wanted to say, actually, I'm no longer with the uh, University of Qatar, but I am a research fellow at the University of Vermont Institute for Environmental Diplomacy and uh, Security. Um, so I was asked to really also share my experiences in Qatar and uh, the Gulf. Um, so I, I am actually an architect and urban planner, so working very much from a spatial approach, planning approach. And um, I've also uh, worked on borders and transboundary uh, planning. So um, from a sort of diplomacy point of view, I've been interested in concepts like Blue Peace, that which is actually um, uh, in Geneva, there's a Blue Peace organization which, which works around water and peace. Um, they have some initiatives, for example, rethinking the Middle East water, etc. Um, so it's mainly based on, on fresh water. Um, as you will see afterwards, my work is also um, looking at this idea, obviously, of multi-track diplomacy and, um, and science diplomacy. So, um, uh, so the idea of science diplomacy is also uh, looking at sort of shared resources as an opportunity for collaboration. And also often I've worked on the Korean demilitarized zone and the Cyprus buffer zone. And in cases where there's no real um, collaboration between the two sides, often scientists are able to collaborate. So that's the importance of science diplomacy. And of course, environmental diplomacy, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm, I'm a member of the Institute of Environmental Diplomacy and Security. Um, so this is the an important um, uh, sort of approach that, that I work with. And one example here is, for example, is uh, the example I will show you afterwards um, between Qatar and Bahrain is a certain conventions like the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands, which can be uh, sort of used as, as a step towards uh, uh, environmental diplomacy. Um, there's also the idea of bottoms up peace building because it's also uh, sort of sometimes citizen led or NGO led, especially in cases where there's no real you know, contact or, or diplomatic relations at the national level. So it's often civil society activists, grassroots NGOs. Um, and I will explain later how I've worked actually with NGOs on some of these uh, um, projects. And then citizen diplomacy um, is also another idea which is very similar to, to the um, bottoms up. Uh, for the art and science diplomacy, we mentioned science. Um, Geneva has just set up the Geneva Science and Diplomacy Anticipator, which is just recently created. But they also link very much with the Cyber Peace Institute and the Swiss Digital uh, Initiative. Um, so obviously in Geneva, we have the UN, so we have a lot of these organizations, also environmental organizations, UN, etc. Um, and here I'm just mentioning this was a project, um, this was an art science residency in Marseille where we had Professor Azim Zia from the University of Vermont, a specialist in public policy and environmental planning, Professor Kim from Landscape Ecology and Urban Planning in Korea, who I've worked a lot on the Korean DMZ. We also had a biologist from the north part of Cyprus um, who'd worked on studies of biodiversity in the Cyprus buffer zone. Evi Teleki, who's an artist, uh, engaged, socially engaged artist, and another biologist uh, working on, on the DMZ. So you can see here this idea of bringing together the artists, the scientists, and the, the specialists in environmental planning and diplomacy. So uh, the Persian Gulf, of course, I put the Persian Gulf, it's, it, this is a sort of another diplomatic, we often, in, in, when I was in Qatar, just said the Gulf, because of course, uh, you know, it can be the Arabian Gulf or the Persian Gulf. Um, but the, the, the bioregion of Qatar is, um, it's a dry land, it's a desert, they have a high abundance of energy, it's one of the world's largest exporters of liquid natural gas. Um, and a lot of food insecurity. We'll see later that the, you know, there was a blockade in 2017, so actually a big crisis, a political diplomatic crisis, a lot of water insecurity, health issues, um, and, 
a sort of growing population, but a population which is 75% male because of the migrant, a lot of migrant workers and 20% of local, local population. So what's interesting is that Qatar has played a role in, in regional peacemaking just recently, obviously with the inter-Afghan uh, peace meetings that have been held and other uh, initiatives. This is Sultan Barakat who's, who's uh, written um, about some of these uh, initiatives. Um, so what happened during the blockade, this was 2017, um, so the, the, all the land, air and sea routes were cut off from the UAE, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain and Egypt. Um, so from one day to the next, uh, a lot of the food which passed through Saudi Arabia had to be resourced. Um, and even, you know, obviously the sea routes and air routes had to be modified. So really it went from being a peninsula to uh, an island, increasing flight times, uh, you know, not, not being able to fly directly from Dubai to Qatar, having to go, you know, in, in, in other, other routes, suspended routes. Um, however, recently people have said, well, in a way, maybe this blockade prepared Qatar a little bit more for the, for the pandemic. Um, it made it more resilient. It's been, you know, looking to uh, grow more food itself, become more independent. Of course, it can't grow all its food, it's resourced the food, etc. So it had really a first crisis. Um, this crisis of COVID has revealed strategic vulnerabilities in supply chains. And this already happened to Qatar in 2017. Of course, it was an opportunity to rethink about food. So there were many different approaches. I was working on food urbanism with my students, but one was they did actually import some cows. Um, so, you know, is that the, the way to go? Or to rethink really what kind of foods, um, you know, are we eating and what are our sources of protein? And for the future, you know, what kind of foods do we need to, to uh, produce that that's obviously create less environmental impacts and, and are, you know, are possible to, to grow. So there's a lot of work now in microalgae, spirulina, etc. Um, so what happened here during this time as well in 2017, there was even a project by Saudi Arabia to create a canal and separate Qatar from Saudi Arabia. So obviously, Thank God this was this was not really um, uh, uh, they did not go through with this idea. But what's interesting is this area is actually this border area is is an area of high uh, environmental interest and biodiversity. And it was actually nominated as a UNESCO site. So there is a really great potential of having a sort of transboundary UNESCO um, reserve. And you can see on these old maps, actually, that that originally um, Bahrain and Qatar were actually islands, um, uh, so that's quite interesting to see how you know the island became um, a peninsula. So here, it's actually a very unique uh, landscape, um, uh, which is why it's been proposed uh, for UNESCO. It's also an area where people come for for tourism, for nature. These are osprey nests, there's a lot of um, wildlife and birds. Um, and here, this is um, the, the sensitivity mapping. So, you know, what, what, there are very sort of highly sensitive ecological areas. So um, this was a presentation, a paper that we presented at uh, Cambridge University, the Gulf Research Meeting last year with one of my students. So the idea was talking about blue bridges and blue peace. Um, and it was really about, uh, you know, uh, cross-boundary collaboration um, over endangered species and habitats, uh, cultural and technological innovations, bioremediation to restore ecosystems, cultural exchanges, etc. And um, as we presented this, of course, this was in the context of the, the crisis, because I started this work before the, the Qatar crisis, talking about um, the, the the conflict between Bahrain and Qatar on the borders, which, which was um, a previous conflict. Um, so what's interesting is that really these borders became very important when we started exploiting the natural resources, the oil and gas. Of course, you know, we had to know exactly where the borderline was to know if we could, you know, which country could actually uh, exploit this. So the, a lot of, there's still some, um, uh, conflicts over strategic islands between um, Iran and the UAE, etc. So um, here you can see actually the oil and military sort of landscape. So so a, a lot of this, oil, obviously, the oil is is inside, you know, is in the Gulf. And then there's all obviously the resource infrastructures. Um, uh, maybe this builds on quite well on, on Heather's presentation because she's really working on these infrastructures. But we can see really in a way that how 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 they're woven together. 
um, by these infrastructures. Um, on the other hand, you know, there was a necessity really to create all, um, all these borders. And then a project of a railway, which has been a wonderful project actually of the GCC railway, which of course is now um, stopped also because of the Qatar conflict. But here you can actually see the territorial waters, this pass field, this gas field, which is shared with uh, Iran. Um, and the other oil uh, and gas fields of uh, Qatar. And here, this is actually a really good representation of, of how much of the actual resources are, are, are outside of the, the, you know, the territory, the, the, the land territory of Qatar. Um, so the Hawa Islands, um, so we have an evolution, 71 Qatar becomes an independent state. Uh, and in 2001, it settled the long running border disputes with Saudi Arabia and Bahrain. Um, and then um, the 2008, the delineation, and then we had the blockade. So in fact, in fact these borders were, were sort of reinforced again. Um, so after there were 36 years of dispute, um, and they were finally, these Hawa Islands were finally given to the, the island of Bahrain. Um, and then there were plans to build a friendship bridge, which also would have participated in this new network and GCC railway. This is the, the friendship bridge that was proposed, which would have allowed also uh, you know, to go in, in very short time to Bahrain. So here you can see how the border was drawn, this red line. And you can see that the Hawa Islands are actually, you can actually walk over to them uh, in low tide from Qatar. So they were very, very close to Qatar. Um, and, and what's interesting about these is that um, the Hawa Islands have also been proposed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site and um, they also have um, a lot of biodiversity and endangered species. Here you can see the mapping and the proposal for this Ramsar site. So, so because of all these these sort of uh, the wetlands and the endangered species, we have turtles. Obviously, there's migratory birds. There's also a lot of dugongs, uh, which are mammals, which we find in the sea, also endangered species and uh, dolphins, etc. Now, on the Qatari side, uh, you can see the Hawaii Islands to the left. Uh, we have the Al Rim UNESCO. This is proposed as a UNESCO biosphere. Um, so this is why we started working on this with our with our students actually before you know even before the blockade. But the idea was this Al Rim Hawa transboundary reserve. So we started to look at this the planning of this uh, transboundary reserve. So here, what you can see, you see Qatar, Bahrain, the Hawa Islands. And this is a sort of complex mapping of the sensitive areas, you know, the habitats, uh, etc. Um, and then sort of the bridge. In fact, what we proposed with the students was this idea that the bridge, uh, you know, because it's obviously been criticized, but it's also a way, obviously, you know, to implement the, the GCC railway. But it could also actually become a gateway to a protected area, this bridge. And it could be built in a sort of an ecological way to generate uh, energy. And there's also a problem with the with the circulation of the seawater. So a lot of corals are dying, etc. So the idea is, is it could be even an inf an ecological infrastructure um, that that helps to regenerate uh, this space. And I'm going quite quickly over these projects because I, I don't have time to go into them. But these are just sort of scenarios and projects we developed with the students here. You can see this uh, this friendship bridge, which would become a sort of multifunctional eco gateway and infrastructure uh, with all sorts of different functions to help uh, regenerate um, the the different ecosystems um, here between Bahrain and Qatar and also work for the conservation of species. Now here I just want to show an, an example. This was uh, Transboundary Conservation Peace Building in 2015. I was moderating a panel with um, the, the Institute of Ecology in Korea. Then we had Eco Peace Middle East, who are working on water, Blue Peace in, in the Middle East. Also, the World Wildlife uh, Fund, uh, the UN Environment Program, um, and uh, Transboundary Conservation. So, so um, this really brings together a lot of NGOs, international NGOs, um, uh, this subject of, of peace building. Now, this is actually the, the, the report that was published on biodiversity and the loss of species. And one of the species that was shown on the report was uh, the turtle. I started to work in Qatar on hawksbill turtles um, with my students. It's actually one of the most, there are seven types of turtles. This is one of the most critically endangered turtles and it nests uh, in Qatar. So with the students, we did with the undergraduate students, we did turtle pavilions, we did awareness, we did designs for this, but also on National Day, we, we proposed the turtle as a, as a 
a flagship species to get more attention. Um, and uh, also we created a sort of public art. We worked with public art to create uh, public art in the university and also in the um, in the in the center of town, there was a, there was an event um, for National Day with, with the kids. Um, so we really started to raise awareness um, and create um, designs uh, for an eco beach. This is a design by the master's students. So we're creating this ecological beach for the where the turtles nest because for the moment. Um, there's a lot of cars driving, so so there's a real degradation of the ecosystem. It's very hard for the turtles to nest. They always come back to the same uh, beaches to nest. So um, this was with our students working also on these sort of integrated resilience loops. And here on the left, I'm in Oman because, in fact, I went to Oman. Um, they have a turtle beach, an eco beach there. So the idea was to, to look at these examples in the region. Um, and then bring that back to Qatar to create this eco beach. And here I was volunteering in, in Qatar on the eco beach. And, um, and one of the things that they do there is they do the tracking of uh, the turtles. Um, so there's this idea. So we bring in, in a way here, this idea of the digital as well. And the idea here is, is in a way that this turtle, especially since the blockade, um, you know, these turtles sort of, these are the tracking of the, the turtles in the Gulf. They sort of become ambassadors, you know, in a way of peace, because, you know, while there's no, you know, there's no boats that can can do this kind of, you know, um, uh, journeys, um, obviously the the turtles still can, and we can still track them, you know, going from, from one place uh, to the other. These, these are the habitats um, that, that are in, in this area. So um, I've also worked with this concept of blue, but not just for the, the fresh water, the blue piece, but for really sustainable urbanism in Qatar and also inspired by Sylvia Earle saying the world is blue. So it's not just, of course, a lot of the planet is, is, is ocean, but a lot of cities I work in urbanism are located uh, by the coast. And we now have a lot of threats by rising sea levels. So I also talked about blue as a new green because in Qatar, uh, there's not much water, so if you want to have any green, you need to have also the blue. And I, I actually published this um, chapter with all these these different approaches that we had um, in Qatar and did different sort of workshops around around sustainable urbanism and this this blue approach. Also looking at biodiversity with one of our students, we were um, she did her master's thesis on a wetland, which is using treated sewage effluent. So how we recycle the water. And with our students, we did a sort of bottoms up initiative here. We created an NGO. We designed a project um, to save this wetland, which was going to be decommissioned um, by the authorities. You can see the wetland here, uh, the core here. Um, so we were also creating a green network. And this is a project that, that with our students, we brought to the public works authorities and finally to the Minister of Urban Planning. So this idea of the bottoms up as well. So, um, you know, we really need to work both from the bottom up and then obviously work with the authorities to be able to implement these projects. So with this blue, we also looked at the sea level rising, which is another threat, especially in these areas. And this was a, a plan for the Corniche, the Doha Corniche, where we work with uh, halophytes, we work with seawater rather than um, sort of, uh, how do you say, desalinating all the water. We actually work with seawater for plants, halophytes, for underwater urban, for urban farming, et cetera, and to make a more porous edge and more resilient, also working with oyster beds, et cetera, and all these kind of ecological ways to make a more resilient edge. Um, always looking at water, energy, waste, and, and food as well. Um, and this concept of saline agriculture, which is being explored in, in the region. So also here we're looking at the infrastructure of the water, the treated sewage water, so how we can use this water then for the urban forestry and also creating a green belt. So the green belt is one is obviously to stop the urban expansion, but the other we also looked at a, a green belt for the desert, for the dust storms, etc. So it has many ecological benefits. Um, obviously, urban trees using the, the 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 treated sewage effluent, and we also looked at mangrove belts all around Qatar because these are also important for um, as sort of ecological um, infrastructures for the sea level rising. So uh, finally, I wanted to end with this uh, tool that I mentioned earlier. Um, uh, that was developed with um, the University of Vermont, the University of Vermont, the Institute of Environmental Diplomacy and Security, with Professor Salim Ali, who wrote a book on peace parks, 
And during my, my PhD, I, I found this book, it was a, an atlas of future wars. So we said, well, let's make an atlas of future zones of peace and ecological cooperation. And we were also funded for our first workshop uh, in Switzerland, where we started to do a prototype for this community mapping. And once again, with specialists from Cyprus, uh, scientists, also people from the University of Geneva, the, the UNEP, um, uh, the Center for Transitional Justice, and also Professor Salim Ali, um, etc. So we worked together on this prototype. This was also once again in Marseille. We were working on the second prototype, and it was sort of featured in the uh, National Geographic. So the idea of this is also because we can't always collaborate physically or meet. The idea is is that an atlas can have many different sources of data. We saw earlier, obviously, the, um, the you know, the, the, there's there's special data sets, satellite data sets, data from, from you know, all these UN agencies, et cetera, um, that can be uploaded on this platform. But there's also, afterwards, we'll see that, you know, certain can be viewed by uh, specialists or diplomats, others can be viewed by users. And there's also the citizen or the crowd, let's say the crowd uh, sourcing of information when we're talking about um, endangered species, for example, um, in in Cyprus, what's happening is a lot of um, that, the, for example, the um, the uh, monk seals, which are highly endangered, which are found in the buffer zone in Cyprus are actually spotted by the military so you know the military can also aid in this and then you can have different granularities etc so this was just um a, sort of an explanation of of how this um this tool can be used in these border areas and obviously you know identifying all the different stakeholders um uh is very important as well so this is another publication which uh, was uh, on this theme is looking at the social ecology of the border landscapes and finally, to finish off, um, another thing that could really be important um, and, you know, possibly also maybe could be the object of another kind of digital platform would be looking at food, water, energy nexus in the Gulf, because it's also something that's really important for security. There's a lot of talk of food security, water security, energy security, and we really need to look at the nexus. And so this is another project that, that an international project that was funded at Qatar University, where we were looking at food, water, energy nexus. Of course, I won't go into that now, um, but but I think it's also um, here this was a the the university was sort of a living laboratory but the idea is that you know this could be also a way of of creating a sort of uh, a, you know a diplomacy around food water energy nexus in first of all in the gulf and then possibly uh, elsewhere um so i'll i'll finish there thank you thank you very much for your attention Thank you for your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, so the floor is open to questions to all three of our speakers. Um, when you put the question, please uh, let me know, or just you you can can just uh, speak up yourself, or you can type in uh, in the chat, uh, and you can also type in in Facebook. Uh, just let us know uh, who uh, you whom, whom you are addressing with your question. Maybe I'm gonna I'm gonna go first if that's okay, Brigitte. Yeah. <clears throat> the, um, no, thanks a lot for for uh, for your talks. I learned a lot. Um, um, just a, just a, a few questions now to uh, to everyone. Actually, I'm gonna go in the order of uh, of the presenters. Um, Paul, you basically uh, there were you directed cautionary words uh, uh, to us, which uh, which I think were quite uh, quite important, and I just want to follow up on that uh, a little bit. So, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of critical infrastructures, is there anything one could one could say? What 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 kind of tampering one could do, for instance, with a nuclear power plant? Uh, what what kind of scenarios are there? Um, perhaps even with nuclear weapons, and and there, there's all kinds of redoing of of uh, of, of nuclear technology. I mean, nuclear weapons technology uh, going going on. Uh, does that uh, should we be uh, on guard there as well? Should we? Is there is there a reason reason? So I, I can't really speak to to nuclear weapons. It's a sort of an area that's a little bit outside my 
yeah. domain of expertise. But we, we have the good fortune to do uh, work with the International Atomic Energy Agency, working with them on, on computer security. And I would say that, uh, not surprisingly, that the nuclear, nuclear sector is, is a fairly conservative uh, sort of industry, right, in terms of the use of digitalization uh, and its application. It's also an industry that, um, where there's quite a significant amount of guidance available uh, from, from institutes like the IEA. Um, also, the, the and there's, there's a long history of, of security, primarily physical security, right? In, for, for, um, so, no, I don't think we should be worried. <laughs> Good. <laughs> uh, I think the, 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 in general, the, 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 the sort of facilities are, are engineered in such a way that sort of uh, nuclear security and nuclear safety incidents are, you know, extremely unlikely. Um, so, but, you know, we have to be vigilant. Uh, you know, this, there is this sort of, if you like, creep of digitalization into this industry. So we have to go in with our eyes open and sort of leverage uh, the, the best guidance that we've got and architect our systems and our organizations to be secure. Um, but yeah, I don't think we have to be sort of too, too worried at the, at the moment. That's, that's, uh, that's a, I think that's a fair assessment. Yeah, yeah. And this, this other, the other question I had for you is uh, you talked about um, the, the, the cyber attack against the Ukraine. Yes. Um, now, now, if something like that would happen to Austria, how, how, how ready do you think the country would be to, to react? All these tricky <laughs> questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, tricky questions that are recorded. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Okay, so I, let's, let's, I think in general, I would say that the energy sector in Austria from a cybersecurity perspective is relatively mature. Uh, so I think, for example, um, fairly uniquely, I think in Europe, we have a, a dedicated energy uh, CERT, a computer emergency response team. So an organization that's dedicated to supporting uh, energy utilities in, in the case of an incident. Uh, I think the sort of various organizations that we see uh, uh, across the, you know, the board, so my engagement, for example, bilaterally with, with energy utilities or distribution system operators, in general, I feel that they're, they're, they're on top of, uh, on top of the, the, the issues. I guess the challenge comes as we sort of start to introduce new actors to the to the energy grids of the talk, sort that we've been we, we've been talking about, uh, some of which are are sort of relatively small organisations potentially, uh, with maybe lower security maturity, for, for example, or reduced resources. So, if we talk about things like energy communities or, or prosumers, uh, and security, of course, is not their highest priority. They don't necessarily have the budget to 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 address it. So. And, and they don't necessarily fall under the purview of any regulation, for example. So they, I mentioned the NIS directive, which talks about um, so-called operators of essential services. So there's, you know, energy utilities and, and banks and research institutes, for example. Um, so some of these small organizations sort of maybe slip between the, you know, the cracks. And that's kind of an interesting area where in the future we need to we need appropriate sort of guidance and technical solutions that are well tailored to the, the types of organizations that will use them. But again, in general, I think we don't have to worry too much. <laughs> that's, that's, that's good to hear, Paul. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, let me let me just follow up maybe with with, with two questions also for the, for the other for the other presenters, if I may, but very quickly, because uh, I don't want to monopolize things here at all. Then. Um, Heather, your talk was in very upbeat, right? So, so about about opportunities and chances that we have, and 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 and, and, and I fully agree, obviously, that we have these 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 opportunities. Um, and then towards the end, you talked about uh, regulation, 
And that's obviously a quite an important question, right? Because so, so in a way you talked about surveillance systems and surveillance system can be put to different uses. And, uh, and there probably has to be international regulation. And obviously those surveillance systems, they are by their very nature transboundary. So there has to be international regulations. And I was just wondering whether you wanna uh, tell us a little more than about these, these, uh, these kind of debates that are happening in Geneva right now. And perhaps also from your point of view, normatively speaking, ideally, how would all of that play out? And then, and then Heather, sorry, before, and then I'm just going to go to Anna as well, and then I'm going to keep my, <laughs> keep my mouth shut. Um, Anna, your, your, uh, uh, your presentation, there were lots of important things in there about uh, diplomacy, about different facets of diplomacy. I basically was just wondering the, about the digital aspect always. So, so let's say the blue piece. Uh, you also talked about at the beginning about uh, bottom-up um, what peace transitions or peacekeeping. Um, then towards the end again about ecological cooperation, about peace in, in, in general. So, so I would just like to know a little more, so to, to tease out um, peace and, and, and the digital aspect, how they're related. So, so does, I don't know. Do, that, does it, do digital components actually uh, offer opportunities that weren't there before or, or do they make things more complicated? That's what I was wondering about. Okay. So yeah. I can answer the question about uh, sort of standards for uh, AI. And of course, uh, it's a very complicated topic, topic, so I would not claim to be a, an expert of any kind, but I think there's some interesting work being done at the ITU. There was a World AI Conference, I think last year, that was quite interesting. I know the Oxford Institute is doing some interesting work as well as individual players like Microsoft in collaboration with other industries. So I think it's important to do a good audit of all the different opportunities out there. And there definitely needs to be some kind of international coordination. I think at the EU, there's also interesting work going on, but there definitely needs to be more coordination. And I think industry is always gonna be two steps ahead of regulation. So um, they whatever is developed and whoever takes the lead, it needs to be a public private partnership, but there's definitely a need for some kind of coordination. And it's such a broad and vast topic, it probably needs to be on the industry level by industry specific groups. So for example, for data sharing and energy, there's a lot of work going on with directives specifically around that. And that's where I think you'll you'll see slowly but surely this kind of global governance come together, if that answers your question. Okay. Um, so thank you for your, for your question. Um, so the digital, uh, I, I try to explain with the um the digital and dynamic atlas this is something that that we started developing actually many years ago so it's a sort of work in progress but the idea is that in certain cases for example at one stage um so for example in cyprus um if you're a turkish not a turkish cypriot but you can't cross over in you know into the south or you can't go in the buffer zone you know so so there's a physical limitation um uh which means that scientists can't necessarily meet you know so the idea of a digital platform means that um for, well first of all it can gather different layers of information so the digital allows us um as a planner i work you know we work a lot with different layers and i think we saw it very well also in heather's presentation you know there's always the different layers and um and you know you can go from a very geostrategic layer very very high level you know diplomatic layer to um, to this uh, maybe a crowdsource layer which is really identifying certain species or biodiversity or things that you you know not we can't all do with scientists and so I, I mean I have some examples for example um, where for example the German green belt that was built along the Iron Curtain was the initiative of an NGO of bird watchers on both sides who were you know really passionate about birds and then had this idea to keep this strip you know of the of the Iron Curtain so the idea is that that you know these initiatives which are ecological they're to do with memory to do with peace building don't always come from the top down but sometimes also from the bottom up and i also do this you know with with my students and, and the work is is you know identifying where do we you know, where is there work to be done and um, i think this idea is also that that, that you know the multi-track these different approaches to peace means that you know also with art with music culture 
uh, you know, we can create collaborations and, and it creates sort of a web of collaborations which are outside, often outside of politics. Um, as, you know, as we hope and wait for the politics to evolve, uh, we can still collaborate. So, so that's one thing that we see is, is you know, whether it's in, in Cyprus, for example, where there's no real political discussion, but the artists and scientists can collaborate, as, as I, I saw. In fact, I invited them, you know, for us to work together. So, uh, and so the digital is the idea that, that it does allow to share information and to, you know, to collaborate uh, um, digitally when, when we cannot, and, and especially, I mean, today, as you were just rightly saying at the beginning of uh, the presentation, you know, when we can't actually physically travel or access these places. I'm not sure if I answered, but um, that, that was the idea, yeah. Okay, thank you for the first round of questions. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, I have uh, questions from Karina Karik. She uh, will put forward her questions herself. And then I have another question from the uh, Facebook. So please, Karina, just can you go on and Hello, ask your question? very much. Um, I would actually, I'm a student of the Diplomatic Academy, um, and I would have a question for each of the speakers. My first question is um, directed at Paul Smith, and it is, um, you mentioned in your last slide that, that there is both uh, the, the, the paradox that there is an um, increase of risk, so you called it a tech surface, but also an increased uh, level of security. So how would you personally um, 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 weight the, this opportunity versus challenge, which do you think is bigger? Then um, my second question is directed at um, Heather Clark, and it is um, directed at, um, you mentioned the key question, how the risk, how those who are at risk of um, job loss uh, may be trained. And my question is, are there already any ideas how this training could take place or um, to what extent this training um, might be done? Or is it a question that will um, be answered in the future? And my third question um, is for Anna Grichting. And I was really interested in the science diplomacy um, that you mentioned. And my question is, um, is does, um, do the projects that you mentioned kind of um, relate to the biodiversity beyond national borders from the UN, those negotiations, or are they entirely separate projects? Thank you. So, oh, Karina, very nice question. <laughs> a very difficult one to answer. Um, so, I guess what I would say is that um, I'm an optimist. So, uh, <clears throat> on balance, I think we're heading in a good direction. So, I think with the the introduction of of new technologies, uh, we approach. Uh, the digitalization of infrastructures, critical infrastructures, with a better understanding of the cybersecurity issues and the implications of cyber attacks. So the the way that we're sort of engineering systems uh, for critical infrastructures now, so we're thinking about concepts such as security by design. So from the very beginning, um, you know, thinking about security, how, how to design it in at the, at, the, at the start to make sure that there are no problems. But of course, we're sort of uh, counter to that. It's, we're not, you know, this is not a, a green field. So we're adding digitalization to uh, previously closed off systems where security and maturity was very low. Um, so it, it's a difficult question to answer. So, but in general, I think we're heading in the right direction. Uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a community to improve overall security. Um, but we, yeah, yes, we have to do that, as, as Marcus mentioned. Uh, in a, be careful about how we go forward and, 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 and keep this in mind. But excellent question. <laughs> and it's a difficult one to answer. It's a, again, it's an it's a issue of risk in the end, risk appetite and, and how you want to address that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and thanks for the question about retraining and skills. I think that uh, you really have to look again to government and probably the Nordic countries and Switzerland where they have an apprenticeship program and where it's quite easy to reskill. Those are probably countries I would look at. The World Economic Forum also has an initiative on fourth industry skills. So they also collect some best practice. 
So um, I think there's lots of opportunity there, but it also has to start in primary education in addition to retraining skilled workers. It's just teaching kids, getting them excited about robotics, getting them excited about coding and creating opportunities for them to engage in those areas. Um, in addition to getting more women involved in those areas, because it still is very much a male dominated area. So those would be my, my tips on where to look if you'd like more information. And I encourage you all as students to create those programs. It'd be an exciting area to work in if you wanna bridge together technology and diplomacy in an interesting way that will add a lot of value. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, so uh, I'm not sure if you're rever you, you were re um, referring to biodiversity beyond 2020 or, or which uh, initiatives. So actually the work that I've done in Qatar, Cyprus, and I, I originally started working in, on the Berlin Wall and the Iron Curtain, um, and also in Korea, um, it's because I work on borders where buffer zones where there's conflict and the idea was, uh, you know, how do you build on this, um, on the, eco the natural uh, ecology and biodiversity that emerges in these conflict areas. Um, so, uh, uh, so that's how I've identified um, the areas where I work. So it's really about borders conflict. And that's why, you know, sort of the diplomacy and environmental uh, diplomacy has become uh, you know, one of the the avenues that I work on as as a planner. So the idea is then, um, you know, the diplomacy, but also creating a sort of master plan. And obviously, biodiversity is one of the key aspects because it, it's something, um, well, the flagship species, endangered species is something that is, you know, that is something that, that can sort of galvanize attention, something that scientists can work on. Um, and today we see also that biodiversity has is becoming increasingly important um, and even the discussions about pandemics, you know, the loss of biodiversity, our relationship with nature and, and species, etc. So I'm not sure if I really uh, answered your question because I'm not sure exactly which program you were you were referring to, but I'm happy to give you more information. Thank you. Okay, we've got more questions from Facebook. So there's one. Uh, how is it tenable to digitize international affairs in the face of underlying political and economic inequality in the world? So this is a question to the three speakers. So is there any one of you who wants to start answering? Well, yeah, I'm not a specialist. All I, I would say is... is, is um... I, I, it's a very important question because, of course, the access to the digital infrastructure and the digital network and a quality of digital network is is very important. And I would say that we've seen even during the COVID, with all of this going digital, it's really accelerated digitization, and it shows also that even in places like Switzerland, Geneva, you know, people who don't have good uh, equipment and good infrastructure, you know, even pupils are very disadvantaged, um, you know, with during this period. So it's it's a very important question. And um, yeah, I'm not a specialist in it, but but I do see it um, very clearly. I would maybe say that there are plenty of examples where it could be an equalizer. So I think supply chains are just getting completely transformed. And the fact that you can have people working in um, Cabriri, a very poor area of Kenya and serving directly their clients in California. Obviously there's a big level of inequality there, but at least these people didn't have the opportunity to have this kind of livelihood in the past. And now with digitization, they're able to be part of these global supply chains. And that would have never been possible before because you just don't need as many physical assets to do this. You need the education, mm -hmm. but the technology really can be an enabler and an equalizer in some cases, but it needs to be done in a responsible way, of course. Okay, thank you. Uh, Paul, any comments or? I, no, I'm grossly unqualified to speak on this topic, but uh, <laughs> I, I guess what I would say is, was maybe there are lots of enablers, but in a sense, I think, you know, when we look at the sort of some of the biases and inequality that's introduced, perhaps with AI and machine learning, if we're not careful, it's something that we need to be very mindful of. And in, in that sense, the, the the, the question is, is, is very important. Um, yeah. That's... Okay, thank you. Um, I've got another question for Paul. Uh, to your knowledge, does Huawei really pose the threat some security people make us believe? 
Uh, that's, <laughs> that's a tough question. Um, so it's a matter of risk. <laughs> uh, it's a risk uh, benefit trade off, right? Um, I think, do they really pose the threat? I, I'm not sure. I mean, it, it, one could ask the same question of other significant nation states and their capacity and exhibited capacity to, for example, do, you know, mass surveillance uh, at home and abroad. Um, it, it's just a, it's a risk question in the end. Um, as far as I understand, there's been little techni technical evidence of any capability from Huawei to to sort of uh, I don't know eavesdrop on calls and and these sorts of things, but uh, uh, yeah, it's a risk decision in the end. Yeah. So I have a chance to ask uh, the one or other question. So um, one question uh, I have to to Heather is um, when I understood your your presentation correctly, you do. Uh, Kind of, you help your customers to uh, use their data more uh, in, in in a way so that they can have more efficient processes. And this is kind of you you handle big data. Uh, and uh, me as a so uh, me as a natural language processing person, I handle big data as well. And uh, when I handle big data from specific domains, I really need the domain knowledge. Uh, in order to find something because the data otherwise is too big and too noisy then when I don't know the, 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 the right questions uh, to put into this data. So how do you do this? So have you specialized on uh, energy transmission or uh, infrastructure in a more larger sense? That would be uh, super interesting, at least to me, uh, how you do this in, in, in practice. Uh, Sure, no, it's a good question. I think what I say usually to people to explain the technology is if I want to go to the best cafe in Vienna, I can, you know, put something into Google Maps on my phone. And Google Maps will tell me in a few seconds using satellite imagery exactly how to get there and how much it's going to cost me if I take an Uber versus walking. So it also quantifies the time. So it's just to kind of explain in a really simple way for people who aren't tech experts, what does the tool actually do? So we basically do that for infrastructure. So if you are the national utility of Austria and you need to build a new power line, we help you automate that process. And the way that it's done is a little bit more transparent than what would be considered traditional AI because it's just a decision support system. We basically have trained our algorithm, but it's using basically certain parameters that are set by the client. So those parameters include all kinds of layers of information like the soil type, like the distance a building has to be from a power line, like the height that's required, like this, the other things that are protected, that's easily identifiable using satellite imagery. So you get to set the parameters, so you kind of control the process as the client. So of course we have some know-how in energy infrastructure. There are also set engineering rules that go into the algorithm, but it's really that you get to customize all these different elements um, in a simple form that's part of the software and then the algorithm crunches all that data. So I think our clients like it because it's a little bit more, a little bit more transparent what the result is. Uh, so it's a simple chest checklist and parameter setting that creates the result. If that answers your question. Okay, thank you. So I've got a uh, few more questions. So there is one question for Anna, um, and in particular regarding the Qatar Foundation. Uh, uh -huh. is doing is trying to do the right thing with respect to soft power and developing and that uh, in the developing world. I think this is this was more a comment than a question. Yeah, it looks more like a comment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there is the uh, applause from one person in the audience. Yeah. Uh, then we have when the issue of cybersecurity incidents was being handled, one of the points was attacks are difficult to realize. Uh, in a long run, isn't this uh, det detrimental? Because by the time the incidents are discovered, the effects of this may be catastrophic and uh, irreparable. I think this is clearly for Paul. 
Yeah, that's a, it's a very good question. So indeed, so the the I guess the the adversary's intent is to cause some disruption uh, in a way and and remain undetected, right? So to be sort of stealthily move through an infrastructure and then ultimately, I don't know, cause a blackout or an oil spill or whatever, uh, some environmental damage. And, uh, and that's the challenge for, for organizations. On the one hand, you, you sort of want to be able to, as early as possible, try to detect this adversarial behavior, right? So using technologies and processes and so on to to head head off the attacker before he gets that opportunity or before they get that opportunity let's say um and there's you know technology to do that there's you know lots to be said about information sharing sort of across borders and within across organizations so sectorially and then i guess ultimately this might fail <laughs> as we've seen on a few occasions right so you know we can't build the most you know, security in a perfect way. So there's this notion of resilience that uh, was in the title of uh, of my um, of my talk. The idea here is that basically, as an organisation, you want to be able to, or a society or whatever, to to sort of bounce back, if you like, as quickly as possible, and return to norm, normal behaviour as as much as you can. Uh, so that's sort of a something else that you kind of need to design for and, and think about upfront. Okay, so like, how do you respond to an incident effectively, such that the impact of, a, of an attack of that sort is is minimised? Uh, uh, yeah, but it's that's a, it's a good question. It's it's a difficult one, but I guess it ultimately it comes down to how do you build both secure, if you like, in a defensive sense, and a resilient, and in terms of a sort of an ability to respond rapidly and effectively to to, to an incident. I don't. Know. I hope that somehow explain the space, if you like, of, of dealing with that issue. Okay, thank you. Um, also, the the kind of comment question to Anna has been sorted out. Uh, so Anna uh, and the person asking, they had their private chat. Anna, do you want to comment on it uh, for the whole audience or? Uh, yes, I, I just want to say that I, I agree that they are, you know, taking some good initiatives and, and in the past, obviously, with the Afghan um, peace talks and also just recently they've started to initiate more um, programs and research on um, science diplomacy. So that's a recent sort of evolution of what Qatar Foundation is uh, working on. So thank you for your comments, uh, Mark Robinson. <laughs> Um, I have still one question from Mark Robinson to Heather. Um, how uh, do you integrate the environmental impact assessments and monitor them uh, or over time? Actually, that's from me, the question. So. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. we, we, sorry if I, if I jump in, but we slowly but surely we've got a close the panel you've got one minute left for oh, sorry. announcing sorry, the break sorry, sorry. It's my computer <laughs> time is ahead so <laughs> oh so maybe my i have a long longer time so now you've got still one minute uh i would thank you all of you and uh, marcus please use your time <laughs> no, Brigitte, thanks so much wisely <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, no, I greatly enjoyed this, this this first panel. Also, thanks a lot for the for the questions that we've received via Zoom via Facebook. We're going to do a fifteen minute break now because with these Zoom meetings, sometimes it's good to to uh, to, to rest the eyes for a while. So we're going to be back uh, on air, so to say, at six fifteen Vienna time. So in fifteen minutes from now, and then we're going to continue with our second panel. Thanks a lot to everyone in the, in the in the first panel, to the speakers, and Brigitte to you as a chair. And I hope to see you again in the in the in the next panel as well. Okay. Thank you, everybody.